Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Gravity Sketch Design Sync, a place where we talk all things design. In this episode, we will be talking with industrial designer Robert Laszlo, um, and we'll be talking about the power of visual thinking. You know, this is a topic really close to our hearts here at Gravity Sketch, as we really appreciate and value um, the importance of drawing and visually representing something when it comes to thinking uh, about complex ideas. So Robert, thank you so much for coming. Uh, and yeah, we're really happy to have you. Thank you uh, very much for inviting me. Yeah, just, just as you, I'm also passionate about drawing and communicating with drawing. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing and discussing it with you as well. Yeah, so first um, let's, let's talk a little bit about your story and how, how do you get to where you are? Where was our journey like? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, well, I, I started out drawing, I guess, as, as most people who, who end up really liking drawing. As, as a kid, I was always drawing. Uh, but yeah, I'm from Romania, good old Eastern Europe, uh, born still in communism. Uh, and my parents were very like risk averse. So they wanted to make sure that I don't end up with a job that is not really paying off that well. So they pushed me towards te uh, technology and, and towards uh, computers. And I quickly realized, okay, I like computers, but I mostly like playing and drawing on them, not necessarily to, to uh, code with them. So I ended up in uh, engineering just because I knew that engineering also has a little bit of technical drawing. And even though it's not drawing as people think about it, I, know, no, I noticed in myself that I really like technical drawing as well. I, I, I like breaking an object down into side views, into sections, trying to understand how that object works. And from there, it was a generally simple uh, transition towards industrial design for me. Well, less generally, because so I studied industrial and economical engineering, and that's mostly mechanical engineering. It was four years, so it was three years mechanical engineering and one year economics for the industry. And I was watching too much German television as a kid, uh, so I learned German from that because there was a lot of cartoons on German television. Mm -hmm. And I sort of fell in love with Germany and, and I didn't feel that home in, in Romania. So I felt like, okay, I wanna go somehow to Germany. So I found a pretty interesting um, internship, an engineering internship in Germany. And I went there for a year. And while doing this internship, I realized, oh wait, I, I really wanna do more with my drawing and I also wanna keep sort of the engineering part. So I started looking at what sort of uh, ID schools are there that are also affordable. And I ended up with the Netherlands, the TU Delft, which, which seemed to be quite, quite a good choice. And uh, yeah, after a year of internship in Germany, I transitioned to the Netherlands where I did my master's in industrial design engineering. And that's how I ended up here where I am now in, in the Netherlands. And that was uh, 10 years ago. <laughs> and after I was done with my studies, um, I just wanted the job quickly because I also had this Eastern European, I need security quickly. Uh, and I just wanted the job. And that's, I, I had some friends who were doing this uh, visual thinking. I, I didn't know what that was. I was like, oh, it's drawing, fine. I'm, I'm okay with that later. I'll transition into proper industrial design, no problem. And what I learned visual thinking was basically helping people communicate with visuals, what we're going to talk a little bit later on. But anyways, it was a young company and I really loved it. We traveled the world. We, we, we did a lot of interesting jobs for us sort of companies. And yeah, after a while, I, I felt like, okay, I, I feel like I need to grow on my own a little bit more. So I decided to go freelance. And uh, yeah, I'm doing mostly now visual thinking, but also a little bit of product design in my free time and also like concept ideation. Uh, a little bit of everything that has to do with giving ideas a shape and helping people communicate with visuals. I think that's wow. quite, interesting. yeah, quite the journey there from engineering, which is, I think a lot of uh, designers can relate to these, um, these parents being a bit kind of like afraid of their kids going to art or design or any of these kind of like creative um, industries and like almost pushing the engineering doctor side of things. Um, yeah. So yeah, definitely relate to that. Um, but it was quite the journey that you took from engineering all the way to design, and now using probably all the, all of the skills that you end up you know gathering throughout all of these um, years into eventually helping people out with uh, you know understanding their really complex uh, 
ideas through a way that comes really natural to you. Yeah, absolutely. So, so engineering and just uh, just going into university in general really helped a lot because it helps with the analytical way of thinking. It helps with like really listening what the client says and trying to break it down, formulate, reformulate the problem in, uh, in your head and then just quickly try to give it a shape. And then really all the steps in design especially in the beginning of design, the fuzzy front end where you go out, you try to find the problem, then you try to define the problem, and then you start coming up with different sketches. You also sketch out the, the context where the problem is in. So all of these tools I can take and I, I can put them into a business perspective where I'm with the client and, and the client has an issue within the company. And the good thing is also that I'm not an expert there. I'm an expert in trying to take it and, and turning it into a visual. So what, what, what I'm really good at is I'm being a person who's outside of the box. So I'm sort of forcing them to dumb it down to a level where no mm -hmm. matter in what industry I am, I will understand it and then I can turn it into a visual. And if we manage to do that, then they can communicate whatever they need to to almost everybody in the world. So yeah, it helped a lot coming from design, coming a little bit from engineering to with, with the whole understanding and the whole process. Yeah, absolutely. At the end of the day, it's you're you're following a design process. You're you have your end users, your end customers, kind of like trying to funnel them through really understanding what they're trying to achieve and then helping yeah. them. This is this is also something interesting coming from engineering. Like engineers are a little bit like this. And I, I'm saying it because I, I was like that as well. We we like our processes and our methods and we love love to stick to that. And when I went to design, I, I thought like, okay, it's, it's always going to be, I'm going to do product design, which is I'm just going to give a nice shape or form to, to products. And then throughout my studies, I learned that, oh, no, product design can be process design. It, it can be strategic design. There's so many forms that you can use the same principles that you use for product design, but you can apply it in very many and different uh, shapes of the world, I guess, of, of different kinds of, of jobs. Why, why is it that when you visually represent something, it becomes easier for people to understand? It's, it, I, I would just go back to the, to the same old uh, uh, one image. Uh, so how is it? One image says more than a thousand words. Uh, <laughs> but I, I would say, so obviously I can't back this up, but I would say like if, if we look back in, in the past when we were much more primitive human beings, when, when we were doing, uh, when we were going out hunting or when we were uh, even gathering, like we needed to recognize patterns. We, re we needed to recognize things quickly. So our information uptake is, is much better and quicker when we see information. This whole writing and the charts and everything that we developed for ourselves, that, that is something that we developed only if, if, we look, if we look at it evolutionary, not so long ago. But the also recognizing pictures, images, forms, shapes, silhouettes, that has been in our DNA for, for a long time. So that's, that's why it's very easy and recognizable if, if you draw a person, an arrow, and, and a toilet, and you know, okay, what's happening here? You don't have to write down anything. So we can easily, at least that's, that's, that's what I think, why it's so easy to, for us to communicate with visuals. Yeah, I agree with you, but then it makes me think, I mean, why, why did we stop doing it, right? Like what, at what point did humanity just suddenly decided to stop visually representing their ideas and then turn into just like using words? Um, there's something there about, you know, the social aspect of people not being able to sketch perfectly and so they don't sketch anymore. Uh, and then we need people like you to actually come and like sketch for us. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, like, well, yeah. I think, I think if, if you look at stuff like uh, hier hieroglyphs, 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 uh, the, the Egyptians, how they were writing because they were writing with sig symbols and signals, right? Uh, it, one, it, it takes up quite, quite a bit of space. And so unless it's in the right context, I think visuals can be misinterpreted. Hence all the funny memes that are flying around on the, on the internet as well, because you can take something from one context, apply it to a different context, and it, and it means something uh, almost totally different. That is, that is why I'm, when I'm in, in uh, I usually I, I draw within the context of a company. So something that uh, like, okay, I'm, I'm a very easy cheat that I picked up uh, early on is that when you bring value to a company, whatever you do, it brings value to a company. 
I just quickly drew a diamond. So this sort of works across every, every client that the diamond is going to be value everywhere. But you could draw the same thing that might have different meaning ac across different clients. So it, I feel like while visual communication is much easier uh, and, and easier to understand if it's in a correct context, writing does help with, with, with the whole making it much more um, expanded and, and, and not, not, I don't want to say clear, but uh, I would say like if, if you want to put push much more information into a small space, maybe it's easier with a whole bunch of just text, 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 but it's not necessarily nicer to read a whole page than just looking at a nice image and, and finding the interesting little things in it. Yeah, or quicker, quicker to yeah. just at a glance understand the whole thing. Exactly. Um, Great. All right. Well, I think before we jump into talking about your process and your, uh, you know, your visual alphabet that you have and so on, I think it would be great to um, to jump into a demo for everyone out there to really understand what we're talking about. And then there might be even some questions from the audience about, you know, your work and even how to get to do what you do. Yeah, so. Yeah, let's let's jump straight into it. Um, Robert is going to use me and Shay, my co-founder. He's about to join um, as clients, um, and so we'll be talking about the the mission of Gravity Sketch. What is it that we're trying to do for our users and our community? And then Robert is going to just do his magic. Hi, Shay. Hey, Shay. Hey, Robert. Thanks for uh, spending some time with us today. Looking forward to it. Of course. To looking forward to to giving some visual uh, to your to your mission vision yeah so going. how do we start do, we, do you start with asking questions or is it yeah so different? so it's, it's usually asking question but the, the the easiest question is what what is your mission vision because usually uh, the clients already have an idea where they they want to to go with their company so uh, i would say uh, let's 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 uh, make it easy and uh, can i share my screen Yes. That's an option. Yeah, you can. There we go. So there we have Photoshop. Uh, then a question would be like, what do you want to communicate with uh, your clients, with your users, let's say first? I think there's like a shared understanding that yeah. we all have it's ideas awesome. and the things that we're seeing in our minds are 3D. Um, however, the most immediate way to get these things out is through 2D. And when you do want to get into the 3D space, um, usually digital, it is a big bit of a challenge. And so we understand that challenge and we want to help alleviate that challenge. So getting from 3D ideas to 3D visualization. So do you, do you want to bypass this, this 2D? Because the, the challenge is, as you said, going instead of 2D straight into, into 3D. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it would be great if you could just think of something and then materialize it some, somehow. I mean, that's the, the superpower that uh, we love to deliver. I don't think technology is quite there yet, but um, there's always this, this 2D phase. We've been using this as, as humans for thousands of years. So there's some sort of maybe even like programmed part of us that, that has this kind of uh, appreciation or admiration for it. So it's really hard because when you speak about bypassing 2D, it can come across as a little bit um, disrespectful for the legacy that the 2D craft has given us. So we, we, we tend to tiptoe around that a little bit and talk more yeah, about like empowerment, getting to 3D faster, if that's truly the path that the user wants to take. But there's always a path through 2D as well. Uh, just a second. Uh, that's interesting that you said that, that you so, sort of uh, a tiptoe around this area. Do you do you feel like wh why do you feel this need for for the for the tiptoeing? I think there is. I mean, tiptoeing in the sense of the, there is already this um, this value that designers and creatives and everyone that really understands how to sketch and visually represent something has. Um, so it's really. And we appreciate it as well, right? We're designers, uh, Shay and I, so we, we do tend to represent things by sketching on 2D. Um, so there is this, um, there's always this balance between 
pushing for people to represent and create and think in 3D and stay and keep everything in 3D while still being able to combine the 3D benefit, uh, the 2D benefits of it. Okay, so basically, yeah, okay. So a good point to, to, to put here is taking the benefits from 2D and applying it to what you're giving your, your uh, customers, your clients. Yeah, exactly. And like, there's a place for 2D, like for this, for example, this is a great platform where you're sketching in real time in Photoshop and we're, we're sharing. So a lot of these ideas that you're sketching are 3D by nature, like people, cubes, thoughts. Um, but would this make sense to do in Gravity Sketch at the moment? Maybe not. Maybe this is like the perfect platform for this. So it's about like knowing when to include this. But, you know, if you're sketching out a vehicle or a piece of furniture or something that has to do with the ergonomics and the human body, um, the direct to 3D translation from your idea straight into some sort of visualization could be very powerful and really help alleviate some of the confusion or the iteration that you do with yourself often. Yeah, and I would say that there's something here about, you know, there's people that have the skill to be able to represent ideas, three-dimensional ideas in 2D, like you're doing it right now. Um, but there are certain other people that might not have had the training to do so, or, you know, maybe the skill is not necessarily something that they have in themselves, but they still have ideas, right? They still have things that they're thinking in their minds and they're, they need to have a way in which they are able to express them, a natural way to expressing things. Like if you see me, myself, like moving my body right now in space, it's a very natural thing to do when you're trying to, you know, describe something, you use your body to do so and you use the space around you. So it becomes a bit more natural for people that might not have the skills for 2D sketching uh, to be able to represent something visually. Okay. So uh, how much how much time do we have, by the way? I, I don't want to. Uh, yeah, I think we can just wrap it up in, in the next uh, two, three minutes. OK, so then uh, maybe just it's, it's good. So we have a vision. We know you want to go where, where you come from, where you, you want to go. Uh, who are the people that you're targeting? It would be good to put maybe here as well. Yeah, I mean, at the moment, we're looking at everyone um, who is in this design, art, creative discipline. I mean, anyone with an idea. And the long-term vision is even academia. I mean, molecular biology or physics, geometry, all these things require us as humans to think in 3D, but we need to absorb and consume that information through 2D means currently. So is there a future where we can think in 3D, create in 3D, deliver ideas in 3D, and kind of keep all of our 3D world truly 3D. Um, and that's that's a huge, a huge ambition. And um, I think we're learning every step of the way. So the, the ultimate goal is to to keep yeah keep keep the 3D thoughts and ideas in 3D straight from our brains into into some reality, whether it's virtual reality or the actual physical tangible world. Uh, okay, then I would say one last question, and then we just check back if, if uh, this makes sense to you. Um, what else would you communicate? So we have the what, we have the user who you're targeting. What else would you like to implement in your vision that you would share with uh, people? I think one thing that is missing here that we spoke a little bit about it, it's the collaboration aspect of things. So when you are thinking about a three-dimensional idea product let's say a product that is going to have to come to life it's there's many people in the process like involved in the process right but this collaboration and communication aspect is really important because if you're not able to talk about the same thing um, and, and stay uh, within the same kind of like mindset uh, then it leads to a lot of time wasting a lot of miscommunication probably a lot of money spent so this aspect of being able to have multiple types of people and brains and skills talking about a three-dimensional object um, is really important yeah and just to add to that yeah. you know when you have teams i mean we both worked in in, in industry and when you have a design team and an engineering team who don't talk to each other until they finally have something that they agree on you, you think about the relationship between these people um, it's often breaking down like, oh, engineers want to block us or stop us from doing stuff or designers want to make things that are unachievable. And, you know, hopefully 
through having this clear communication in 3D, everyone's on the same page. I mean, we, we all speak the 3D language. We just speak different dialects of the same language. And so hopefully kind of bringing everyone together in a common language will create a more harmonious workplace, better execution on products, and the end customer gets a better product because it's better designed and well thought out and more voices were involved from the very genesis of, of, of the project. Okay, so um, <laughs> let me just do a very, very rough redraw because so this, this was mostly the, the, the gathering part of, of the information. And then uh, I would, at this point in the process, obviously I would take this and we take a couple of days, do a couple of redesigns and, and see what works best for the client. But the idea, what I captured here is just to go through it. So we have the brain, the, the 3D is in the brain, but obviously it's hard to communicate this because what we can do right now or what we could do until now is putting it on a 2D plane, whether that be pa paper or a screen. But what you are trying to do is give it a true 3D form, which as, at the moment is VR, but it could change, of course, what, whatever the future technology is. Uh, you want to help with this tool, uh, every creative on the world, and also you want to help in academia, like let's see how further we can push this. Uh, and important things that you take along on the road are the, the benefits that you take with you from the 2D, the quick communication, uh, the, the clearness, uh, some of the fixes that come in here as well, which is uh, confusion. And you can also do a lot of iteration uh, this way. Uh, this, this is how you empower the users, but you also empower them by giving them uh, a, a way of communicating and collaborating with each other. And in this case, I showed designer engineer a marketeer and everybody comes together to 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 understand each other in this truly 3D space. So what I would probably do is is, is draw a, a human brain and maybe draw some some of the uh, difficulties. Like we would go a little bit deeper. Uh, what you saw difficulties in, in in the 2D communication in your research, and then how we can take this. Uh, we will take the the benefits. We would take the fixes. Uh, and we would also take the so the empowerment and the uh, collab and communication and how we can end up at, at like a, a proper 3D, which I don't know if it would be important to, to showcase. Oh, sorry. <laughs> because of the digital working environment, I set up a break, a break for myself. <laughs> I quickly stopped that. So the end result would be this true 3D world uh, with which you are targeting all the creatives in the world and also the academia. So your, your visual would be probably something like this, but then nicely worked out, which now we don't have the time for. No, this is cool. This is really cool. I mean, from a visual perspective, I feel like you've captured quite a lot of the aspects of what encourages us and motivates us as a team to, to tackle this complex space. So uh, yeah. well done. Thank you, thank you. All right, thank you, Robert, for the demo. Thanks, Jay, for joining us. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, thank you, guys. All right, yeah, this was really interesting. It's it's very different to like think about it when you're just talking about it, and then when you actually become the person that is having to like put out their ideas and then have you kind of like sketch them. That's really uh, yeah, really different. And the first thing that came to my mind is like, wow, how crazy that, like how crazy it is that Robert is thinking so fast about the things that we're talking about. How, how does this happen? Like, do you, do you actually even train to, to do so? Yeah, definitely. So it, it, it comes with obviously years of experience is what helps first and foremost. But secondly, we never did this alone. So when I started out working, it was always two people. Uh, it's the most helpful if you go with a facilitator or um, an advisor, somebody who's an expert in the field and also an expert in facilitating people. But even if not, like it's just two of me, so two, two visual uh, facilitators go. The good thing is that we can switch up. So if we have, because this was, this can't be counted a session, but the session usually goes from two to four hours, depending how much information we have to get out of the client and also put it together. But what happens and what helps a lot in the beginning when you're, you're not used to drawing fast, you're not, not used to immediately translating is when you're with two people, one person can do the, the question asking and the other person does the sketches, does the post-its, and then we switch. 
and then the same thing again. So slowly you start, start getting used to, okay, I listen and I draw. And then if something comes up, maybe you can also pop in and, and ask a question. But it helps a lot that you're not alone. As, as, of course, as years pass by, you're, you're able to do both, but still, I wouldn't necessarily jump straight into drawing. I would, it's, it's very much like a, like a design process that most designers know. I would do the information collection, post it everywhere, then trying to cluster, okay, so what, what do we have for the people you want to talk to in this case? for your vision, what are all the uh, messages that you want to convey, and then we can also cluster the messages a little bit, and then based on that, okay, everybody can go on a five or ten minute break, and I quickly sketch some ideas and, and try to bring it together. So the thing is, it takes time to get used to it, but, but the good thing is, since you're coming from design, and since you're used to like, oh, hey, I have ideas for this product, or we talk to that client, and quickly you sketch most designers we write and we also sketch some ideas so that's already a very good start to get you into this mindset of always sketching and, and, and always being able to quickly transform something into visual yeah i, I agree with with that, that you know like, yeah designers tend to um just yeah we sketch we almost kind of like make those annotations for ourselves in a sketch mode as opposed to using words sometimes I mean, I've been looking back at my at my notebooks, and sometimes I see some sketches, and I'm like, "What did I? Like, what was this about?" Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I I get that part. But then it, it it it's almost like you're going through a creative process constantly in these sessions, um, where you're having to figure out really fast how to represent something, or is it something that you know you've created a, a visual library of how to represent things and you apply them to the sessions that you have with your customers. Yes, I'm going to share very quickly. So it's, it's, it's sort of, uh, here is my head. <laughs> and, and I do have like sort of a, a relatively big visual library. As I said, we have the diamond, which is value. So I, I know if you, want to, if you want to transfer value in the end, I'm just going to plop in a diamond here. And then we know that this is already value. But I have a whole lot of like, we have a piggy bank, uh, we have big buildings for corporations. So obviously in the beginning, you don't know this, but that's why if you work together with somebody, slowly you pick, all up, pick up all these things. Where it gets a little bit harder is when you want to come to a, a, a nice metaphor, because this could have been, for example, a tree as well. So we can go into the, uh, the tree of knowledge, right? And then instead of a brain, and then the, the trees, um, uh, what are the, the ones that go in the ground? Roots. So the tree's roots could be all the knowledge that, that spreads out. So that's, that's where you, so first of all, you also ask the client, like, hey, do you have maybe a good metaphor? Like, are you within a company talking about something? Do you uh, equate yourself to something? Or if not, then you just start coming up. How does this work? How does that work? And also, like in general, just what designers have to do and do as well, like asking the questions, like, how do you see this? Like, what would you represent? Like, just because you're the one who's supposed to draw, not, it doesn't mean that you will always know what to draw. Sometimes it's good to ask the client, like, how do you see this being represented? Yeah, that's, I think that's really, um, that's part of, of, of the, the designer's tool set, right? The instinct of being able to just <laughs> pull ideas out of people or like pull what, what they have in their head. Um, so that you can actually work with it, right? Yeah, ab absolutely. It's, it's this mindset that I feel like every designer has to be in like, hey, I don't know, and that's totally fine. I'm going to ask all the questions. The problem is coming when you either have an ego or, or where you don't know how to communicate or, or where you're afraid of asking the client, that's where you're going to have problems. You really have to be honest and say, hey, I, I don't know, no problem. Let me ask all the questions and I will come up with something. So that, that's how you have to approach everything. Yeah, completely open, no ego. That's that's really good. Also, how I mean, talking about egos and talking about like personalities, how is it actually to be working with these different clients? Some of them might be used to this way of working, but some of them might be new to this way of working. And suddenly you have this uh, person in the room asking questions and like making doodles and, and making it all feel very creative and fun. And that might not be like look very professional, right? Um, how do you deal with that, or have you dealt with that in the past? It's 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 quite interesting because usually when you're hired into a client, there's always somebody who really has your back and is really enthusiastic about what you're doing. So that's already a good thing to lean back on. But usually, I would say. Uh, I, I don't want to say percentage, but many times there is somebody who's an older person or who 
who thinks differently, has a different mental mentality, and they view your drawing as like, okay, this is some child stuff. Like, why, why are we doing this? This is a waste of time. We could be doing some important work. And yeah, the only thing is to, to sort of push through and also concentrate them and, and have them involved. Because usually that person, I would say 90% out of the time, that is the person that by the end of the session is going to come up to you. Oh, and I like how you drew that, but I had the idea, like, can you represent this transition like that? And like, that's, that's really the most fun part. So how I deal with it is, is just, I, I let them be negative and I just let them go through the, go through the, the whole session. Because like, you know, also like the, the whole design process itself, it starts out as a line and then it becomes a big wiggle and then it slowly starts unwinding and then you end up where you end up. And this is, this is exactly the same in such a session as well. And then we're, we're in the, where, the, where we are in this big wiggle and that person doesn't know, like this is horrible. And then slowly when you start coming out of the wiggle, then they're like, oh, okay, I see the value. Let's do this and, do, and everything becomes much clearer to them as well because of the visuals. And then something clicks in them and they're, they're totally on your side. So that's, that's nice. That's nice, yeah, definitely. Which means that you're actually like, you know, doing your job and bringing them to that more creative side at some point. Absolutely. I mean, very rarely it happens that people don't want to just don't want to work along. There's, there's nothing you can do along. But the, the point there still is that you were hired in by somebody who understands your value. And usually the bigger part of, of, of a session, most people in a session understand it and really get something valuable out of your work. So that's, that's where you have to concentrate. Yeah. All right. Um, I would say that, um, I mean, it's kind of like a, a, a detour, not, not really a detour, like you're really using your, your design skills to end up doing what you're doing, but in a way it's not it's not what people normally think when when they think about an industrial designer you know doing work right so and at the end of the day it is something that an industrial designer ends up doing so how what would you say what would you add uh, you know tell people that are looking to go into this career path um you know some advice uh first of all take the take all the electives that you wouldn't take <laughs> because in, in general when you're in school you always go for the electives oh this is easy or this is fun and i missed out on a lot of electives that i felt like oh this, this doesn't interest me stuff like creative facilitation uh, a lot of strategic stuff that now would be extremely helpful and also like as soon as i finished with university i learned that whenever i'm in uh, i'm outside of my comfort zone that's where i learn most that's where I discover new paths that are actually, oh, this, this is actually a viable path. This is also how I plopped in here because, okay, my comfort zone was drawing, but talking to a client and leading a session, absolutely not my comfort zone as probably many industrial, well, yeah, not, not, not the entrepreneurial industrial designers, but the industrial designers who just love to draw and come up with new ideas and model it. And, and those, those people don't necessarily love talking to other people and present stuff. So that, that was me as well. So, that's, that's where I learned like, oh, okay. So the more I step out from my comfort zone, the more I do stuff that I'm uncomfortable with, the more I have to learn about myself. And that's, that's how I sort of stayed here. So one thing, definitely do a couple of electives that are weird uh, and don't like get rid of, if, if you have it, don't think of design as something rigid, as something only to graphic design and only to shape and, and only uh, within uh, a certain industry because design really can go in many places. And, and design, especially in the, in the business world, is very important just because, just as I talked previously about engineers, that they can be a little bit very one way looking, the same with business people. And if you come in as a designer and, and redesign their processes a little bit, it, it makes a huge difference. And, and it's also, don't be su super uh, rigid about only wanting to design products because that, that was me. I only wanted to do products all the time. And I, I thought like, oh, I don't care about process design. And yeah, I'm still not doing process design. I'm mostly helping people. But whenever I'm together with somebody who finished industrial design, studied the same things as me, and they go into proper business meetings and they really, they really help big companies redesign how they approach technically everything. It's, it's just really amazing to see that. So there's, there's a really a lot of ways that you can go from, from design. So don't shut yourself off just because you like one thing. Step out of your comfort zone. 
That's a really good advice. Um, yeah, and it's almost like, yeah, design, design is not a thing, but it's more of a mindset, right? It's not just a profession. It's, it's really how you, you tackle problems and situations in, in life and, and figure out how to come up with solutions. Absolutely. So the, the technically, design is almost everything and design is connected to, to everything. It's, it's a little bit cliche and, and too vague to, to say it like this, but that is the true. Designers are in, uh, inventors, they're entrepreneurs, they're business people, they're uh, drawers, they're drawing people, they're, they're everything and everything is connected to design. So yeah, just, just embrace that and, and try to find your nice little place in it. I like that. Yeah, finding finding your place because it is it is the thing that everyone tries to somehow explain, right? Like what is design and what is design thinking, and and now it has become something that everyone does in like all the different companies in one way or another. So in a way, it starts to be watered down in terms of you know who's actually a designer and what are designers actually doing and, and, and bringing to the table if everyone else is. Is actually like design thinking as well. And I think there's value in both, right? In, in having all the different ways of thinking and mindsets and backgrounds, thinking in a design thinking way, but also bringing some designers ha that have been trained into seeing life in a very specific way. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's also, it's also funny, as you said, like a couple of years ago when we were studying design thinking was something very new and when you were introducing it to a company and the way or, or just in general when you when you were introducing it people were like oh okay this is this is interesting and these days it's such a, it's not even a boss term anymore we're like we're, we're over that it's, it's not even that it's just almost normal thinking and i think this is good this is where we want to arrive because design thinking is a good way of just using your brain so the more people think that way i think the the better products and the better solutions we will end up with. And at the same time, yeah, if you're specialized in it, you can still bring something extra to the people who just have a basic understanding of it. Changing gears a little bit um, here. So there must be this thing in your life where you were almost interpreting things and interpreting life in a graphic way in your head. Is this how your brain works like is this how you live life <laughs> <laughs> it's it's interesting because uh, whenever i watch movies and and you have the internal monologue of somebody i thought always that oh, this is bullshit because i've never had internal monologue i always have internal scenes and and visuals and and i always see explosions and people i, I don't just hear text or i don't just read or i don't just hear words and i don't just read text no I, for me it's always visual and i was like no the movies are wrong that's not how it happens till i spoke with my girlfriend for whom it actually is an internal monologue. She, she's not visual that way as I am. But yeah, as, as you said, most everything in my, in my brain is like memories are visual, smells, something comes back, it's, it's visual. Uh, yeah, my, my thinking is very, very visual indeed. And then you, do you, I mean, there's this thing of the people that are great at sketching and visually representing something, they have these, natural maybe not natural but like a trained talent of being able to deconstruct everything and and kind of like make it into a into a visual representation if you know what i mean so you know like you see a uh, an elephant and you can deconstruct it in a way in which you're going to be able to just sketch it in a good way Oh yeah, well this this is yeah. So this this is this goes a little bit into well for me. Not, I don't know if it's controversial or not, but I don't like calling myself an artist, even though I, I love drawing. I'm very much a craftsman because as like exactly the point of looking at an elephant. Okay, I see the shapes, and I'm going to immediately break it down. Okay, where can I put a square? Where can I put uh, some uh, ellipses, some cylinders to make it easy? And once I have the, the shapes of the elephant down, then I can, okay, let's put some meat on it. I, I sort of know, okay, here, muscles here, muscles here, the tusks go there. So I, I really, as you said, I do break things down as, as much as I can. But then, as I said, it's, it's also, it's less artistic and, and more, it's, it's like a tool. I find it like a tool. So I, I break things apart and then put them together in easy ways first and then I just keep on adding things until I get back to a shape that's again presentable. 
So it's more of a pragmatic kind of like path as opposed to more of a feeling kind of thing. Yes, which is which is annoying because I look at I, I so in my free time obviously I draw a lot I do 3D just just to just to do because I love it but it's not the self expression that you see from artists and I'm I'm, I'm very envious because I just I can't do the oh that's a beautiful image and this represents this and that that and you you look at it oh what what does this mean and this is very interesting I'm just like no no I love drawing objects exactly as they are in nature or coming up with coming up with futuristic objects but. I, I really wish I could also do a little bit of this artistic, putting myself more into it, I guess. Well, yeah, I mean, there's, as you said, it's always good to take yourself out of your, out of your comfort zone. So maybe you, you'll end up doing it at some point. At some point, uh, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> you spoke a little bit about 3D. How, how does this actually incorporate into their into your work or does it incorporate at all or do you see it as something a bit slow because you're so good and fast in sketching into the yeah so that that is pretty much the you nailed the hammer on the head <laughs> <laughs> but the, the 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 problem with me is that I'm, I'm very fast when i have an idea i'm very fast sketching it out and then if i want to make it pretty like i i if i do it in 3d i'm, I'm still relatively slow so I have to invest the time and I am sort of investing the time of learning it, but it, it takes a lot of time and there, there's, there's a little bit of, of frustration that comes obviously with that I know I can quickly sketch it out with pen and paper and there's the idea and everybody will understand it and just really takes uh, a, a little bit longer than I, I, I wish uh, it would take. Yeah, well, I, that's part of what we were talking about in the demo. It's like respecting that there's people that already know how to convey an idea really quickly and really well through a 2D medium. Um, so, you know, sometimes 3D doesn't really make sense in some, in some cases or in some others don't. Um, but yeah, I mean, you said that, you know, most people will understand what you sketched. It's not the case for everyone, so. Yeah, that is, that is true, that is true. But the, yeah, so then, then again, then you end up at the same as, as, as 3D, and that's also where 3D is more valuable. If you need to make everybody understand that you have to put in more time into your sketch. And you can still make a sketch that everybody will understand, but in the same time, you can also make a 3D visual that then you can turn around, that you can move around, that you can look at every angle from, and it's not just one drawing. And that, that drawing you would have to redraw over and over again to, to explain everything from every angle. And that's that's where you sort of, lose a lot of ground to 3D, where, where 3D wins out over, over your 2D sketching skills. Yeah, so over time, it might kind of like compensate that you yeah, I, I feel like if, if you would look, look at the workflow, like in the beginning is definitely 2D up to a point, and then you have a nice overlay and transition in, into 3D, where, where the value changes from, from one to the other. So, Let's talk about your um, your tools that you use for working. I can see you have a nice glove on your hand. Yeah. <laughs> but what else? Like, tell us a little bit about what are the things that like are really comfortable for you to use when you're working. Well, pen, pen and paper is as always. I guess as, as an industrial designer, you get you get taught that pencil is not good. Take a pen. If you make mistakes, you live with it. You learn not to make mistakes or you live to learn with it. So I, I really, do, I just love a, a fine liner, like a dark Sharpie, whatever, and, and a sketchbook. That's that's the first good uh, good start. And, and just, it gives you the best, uh, um, the fastest way of, of working. Then I do have an iPad as, as most designers do these days. I am one of, the older, grumpier people who hates Apple products, but I just gave into the iPad because even I have to admit that's a great product. I always curse the skies though when I have to transfer data from iPad to my Windows PC because it's horrible. But other than that, I also, I built my own PC just because I like to have a powerful, strong PC and I game a little bit on the side. So that, that, needs, that needs to be there. And I do have a Vacom as well. Uh, because it's at the moment it's just more comfortable. It's right here in front of me. You can see the, the, the top, top of it. Uh, because I'm drawing, especially now during uh, the pandemic, all my work is from home and sitting in, in front of the computer is not super healthy for your body, of course. That's why you also saw a little bit in the beginning that app that I have that forces me to take breaks and, and intervals 
plus the, the, the healthy positioning of my uh, Wacom. So pen and paper, uh, Wacom, uh, obviously the computer, then the iPad. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's it. And your <laughs> and brain, your hands and your eyes. Yeah, I forget, I forget about those. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, but in general, also like Photoshop, like if, if we talk about apps, um, I try to still stick with the, with the cheap ones, just, just because a lot of them give me very good uh, results other than Photoshop, because this is what I like about, I think they are, they are smart people at Adobe, because obviously I think most people pirate Photoshop when they start their studies. And then when you start your studies, you get the, the, the license, the student license, and then they sort of hook you in and they never let go of you. So I think all designers are just like, okay, we stick with Photoshop then. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, yeah, although right now with the with the free apps that you have on, on the iPad and so on. But it's not this, we didn't have I, I, saw, I saw some alternatives, actually. I, no, I, I don't remember Affinity or something like that, which is a, a sort of a good alternative to the whole uh, Adobe package. But at, at the moment, me doing also YouTube videos, so I, I use several Adobe products, so they sadly have me locked in for a while until they, they anger me with all their bugs and then I will look for, a, for an alternative. But yeah, definitely there is cheaper and free alternatives. One of my favorite drawing apps is uh, Sketchbook, which is for the iPad and for the computer as well. And it also is mostly used by industrial designers, as, as, as I noticed. It's just a really fun, totally free app, just like yours. <laughs> Thank you for the end. <laughs> um, all right. Well, um, I think we're we're coming up to the end of our of our session. Um, if you haven't checked out um, Robert's YouTube channel and Instagram, he's doing some really, really, really amazing work in there. Um, do you want to say something about you know what you do on your YouTube channel? I mean, I could say it, but I think it comes better from here. <laughs> no, I, I can see it as well. I, I, it just started out when I was growing up uh, again with with the piracy. I had to pirate a couple of, of of tools to learn. So so all sorts of lessons from people in the industry, concept art and stuff like that. And I felt like I wanted to pay them, but I didn't have the money. I was a poor little Eastern European kid. So I said, okay. If I ever get in the in a similar situation, I want to give back. So that, that's that's how I started off my YouTube channel. I'm just trying to put as many tutorials, just share as much as my, of my knowledge there as I can, plus just have fun drawing. So I, I just have uh, live sketching sessions with people there and we, we just have fun. So that's that's my YouTube. And Instagram is, is really just me letting loose of my obsession of robots and sci-fi and just creating mm -hmm. stuff for the future. I just, just the, the typical, I like to imagine things, I put them on paper, so I created something and I feel good about it. But it's, it's, all, it's all futuristic. I, I just, I really love imagine. I guess that's also something that got into me into drawing. I just really love imagining the future and, and sort of giving it some shape somehow. And that's what I do on Instagram. Awesome. Well, we'll be linking uh, Robert's uh, Instagram and YouTube below in case you want to check it out. It's pretty cool. Thank you so much, Robert, for, for joining us in this episode. Um, really looking forward to see what else you create and, and put out on your channels. Thank you very much for this opportunity and also for the, the great app that you created. I'm, I'm now learning it more and I'm having more and more and more fun with it. That's awesome. Uh, I think you've, you've started to share things already on your Instagram. And yes, yes. Also, my, my latest YouTube video was just my, my short learnings on what, what I learned from, uh, through uh, working for a couple of weeks in a gravity sketch on the iPad so far. Awesome. Well, make sure to check it out, guys. Thank you, Robert. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Wish you the same. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.